In 2015, a Category 5 cyclone wiped out part of the island nation of Vanuatu. We don't know what to do. The total cost of the damage came close to $450 million US. That's more than 60% of the country's GDP. Now, all houses have been taken away. It was very much devastating. Even some people up until now, they still recover. After the disaster came a response we're all familiar with. A burst of international media attention, millions in aid from governments and NGOs, and then a long rebuilding process, with the majority of costs covered by Vanuatu's government. But Vanuatu wanted more. It wanted rich, carbon-emitting nations to be held accountable for what it saw as a catastrophe fueled by climate change. Vanuatu contribute to 0.0001% of the global emission. So we contribute less, but we are on the front line. For decades, this small country has played a big role in advocating that aid for climate disasters shouldn't be voluntary. It should be an obligation for the countries doing the most harm to the climate. The idea is called loss and damage. Loss, loss and, and damage. damage. Loss and damage. Loss and damage. It was pivotal to climate talks last year, and it could soon be brought to the world's highest court. Loss and damage is damage from climate change impacts, like floods and wildfires and storms. We weren't reducing emissions as fast as we needed to. Now we need to figure out how we pay for that damage that we can't avoid anymore. So how did Vanuatu find itself at the center of the loss and damage debate? And how can it change the future of climate funding? To understand loss and damage from climate change, I want you to have a look at this map. It shows the economic damage in red, or the economic benefit in blue, to a country's GDP per capita that has come from the use of fossil fuels between 1990 and 2014. Notice a pattern? The red countries are all in the global south, especially around the tropics. Meanwhile, the blue countries, they're all in the global north. Now, this data is a simplified version of a very complex problem. For one, it's based entirely on GDP. So it's not exactly saying that climate change is a good thing for these blue countries. But the pattern is clear. The countries in the global south are losing the most. You know, if anything, we're kind of undercounting the damages that have been done from, from climate change to date. That's Justin Mankin. He's part of a team that created a model which makes it possible to isolate a specific country and then see the economic damage it has done through its carbon emissions. For example, if you look at the United States, the biggest historic polluter, they came up with $1.9 trillion in economic damage. That's damage to infrastructure, agriculture, water quality, and more. They could even isolate the damage caused to specific countries. For example, US emissions between 1990 and 2014 cost the Philippines 34 billion US dollars, according to this data. A separate study estimated that the average GDP of the world's 65 most climate vulnerable countries could drop by up to 20% by 2050 and by 64% by the end of the century, if current climate policies continue. The, the people suffering are not the same ones who are culpable for the problem. And so we're talking about this international wealth transfer from, from poor to wealthy um, in the form of climate impacts. So how would a loss and damage fund actually work? First, let's take a step back. There are two main ways that rich countries fund their efforts to fight the impacts of climate change, both at home and abroad. There's mitigation, which means reducing emissions, moving away from coal, oil and gas, etc. And adaptation, like putting up flood defences, stormproof housing, basically preparing for a world affected by climate change. Richer countries in the global north promised countries in the global south $100 billion a year by 2020 to help with funding for mitigation and adaptation. But the promise still hasn't been met, and much of the money already given out has actually been in the form of loans. That money provided also doesn't cover the rising costs of loss and damage from climate impacts. That's usually mostly covered by the victims themselves and by humanitarian groups. When someone appeals for aid to help 
Pakistan deal with the floods and people donate money. But that system, as the impacts increase, is nowhere near adequate to providing what's needed. Vanuatu has already gone ahead and calculated how much loss and damage from climate change could cost up to 2030. It's in this document here. Its plan includes $110 million to help compensate victims, $25 million for climate-related healthcare, and $22 million for climate insurance schemes. We recover from the food that we, we lost. Uh, we recover from the houses that we lost. We recover from the schools that our kids cannot attend. We are trying to find money uh, around within our own small economy to recover from uh, the, the, the losses and damages caused by climate change. So everybody thought, okay, there needs to be a different fund with some kind of direct access of some kind of the vulnerable countries so they can decide how to spend this money to recover. And that's what we saw play out at COP27. After two long weeks of talks, negotiators finally agreed to create a loss and damage fund. Beyond the fact that this would need to be an absolutely huge pool of money, almost everything else needs to be figured out. Who gets to use it? How do we assess damage? Right? How do you know that it is your molecule that caused my flood? So how, how do you find out what part of that was climate change and what part was just sort of natural cycles? This politics is getting messy and we get messy. One very messy question, who should actually be paying into this? The US is the biggest um, historical emitter. China now for quite a few years has been the biggest producer of climate pollution currently. You've got the European Union, you have Australia, Canada, you know. Rich countries really don't want to be held liable for this. And you understand why, because there's, there's almost no limit to what they might be held liable for if we don't deal with climate change. Some think we're better off taxing companies instead of countries. One study found 71% of greenhouse gas emissions since 1988 were linked to just 100 fossil fuel companies. And some of those companies made huge profits last year. What if it was not countries that were paying into it, but polluting activities by raising money from bad actions so that we raise the cost of doing bad things and we use that money to be able to do good things for those who are being treated unfairly by climate change. So you've got a list of people who should pay, but how do you actually make them pay? Back in Vanuatu, they're hoping to turn to the world's highest court, the International Court of Justice, to try to get some clarity on this issue. They have put together a resolution asking the International Court of Justice to say what responsibility states have, polluting states, to protect future generations, the future of the environment and the planet. That's a really interesting question. It doesn't have full legal authority to enforce something, but they could issue a really influential opinion about that that could influence lawsuits all over the world. For Vanuatu, sea levels have risen here by six millimeters a year since the 90s. That's twice the global average. Some villages along the coast have been given a 24 month deadline to move to higher ground. And with that loss of land comes a loss of biodiversity and cultural heritage. When you talk about the damages, damages is something that you can repair. But the losses, you can, you can lose, but you cannot repair again. When you lose a life, uh, you, you, you lose a life, you cannot re recover, even repair it. What, what vulnerable countries want is not to be out with a begging bowl every time something happens, relying on charity. What they would like is a system where those who cause the problem pay to deal with the problem. I feel always hopeful for the future of uh, Vanuatu. We are a resilient country. Even though we are going through disasters, I believe that uh, changes will always come. Thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed that video, please head to our channel and give us a subscribe and you can watch other videos there too.